Our presenter today is Robert A. Knox, who is a research oceanographer, and he was associate director at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UCSD. His research has focused on dynamics of the equatorial currents of the oceans, taking him out to sea on chartered yachts in the Seychelles, a Royal Air Force launch in the Maldives, and the USS Med Midway, in addition to various SIO research vessels. As the associate director, he was responsible for the fleet of Scripps research vessels and their technical support groups. His undergraduate degree is in physics from Amherst College. His PhD in physical oceanography is from the MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Joint Program in Oceanography. Um, in my opinion, the only competitor for SIO for top claim uh, for oceanography programs. He served several terms as the council member and as chairman of UNOLS, which is the University National Oceanographic Laboratory System. Post-retirement, he returned to serve as the Deputy Director for Research at Scripps for over a year. He's a National Associate of the National Research Council and served on the NRC's Ocean Studies Board and on TOGA, which is the Tropical Ocean Global Atmosphere Advisory Panel. He has also served as President of the Emeriti Association. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed colleague, Dr. Robert Knox. Okay, I think I'm on. We've got some background noise here in my house, but we'll try to solve that. Um, please make sure you don't have audio on on two different services. Yes, I know. Because that We're... is what will give you the feedback. I know. I'm trying to get that sorted out as we speak. Uh, anyway, okay. here, here we go. I th are you hearing me okay now? Yes, thank All you. Right. Um, <clears throat> so I, just a quick word about the title to sort of deep dive into the SAO fleets, plural. We only have the one fleet. Uh, that was more than enough to keep track of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and an hour is too short a, a time to take a really deep dive into this subject. So I'm going to have to uh, instead opt for a shallow dive and try to hit just a few high points about both the history and the current situation of the Scripps fleet. Uh, there's the first slide already up, and that's great. I, I've sort of entitled it Then and Now. This kind of illustrates the changes, the extent of changes over time. The then pictures are from the early 20th century. That lonely structure is the first Scripps building on the present campus in 1910. The ship is the Alexander Agassiz, which was in service from 1907 to 17. And the now pictures are about a century later, the aerials of the Scripps campus and also the modern marine facility at Point Loma, which is in fact a rare view with all the ships in port, not out working. Um, the extent of kind of then versus now change, I think is pretty obvious uh, for both the institution and the fleet. <clears throat> of course, the underlying driver of these big changes has been the remarkable progress of ocean science itself over that century or so of time. After all, research vessels exist to support ocean science. They convey scientists and their equipment out to sea to pursue their investigations and their experiments. There are tools to facilitate scientific progress like telescopes for astronomers or gene sequencers for biologists. The science is always changing and moving forward. New questions and problems emerge. So do new sensors and new methods to observe the ocean in newer, better ways. So research vessels also have evolved at Scripps and elsewhere and they continue to do so. Scripps and Scripps ships have been and still are very significant actors in this progress of seagoing ocean science on the world stage. Research vessels have become a kind of special subset of ships, just as jet passenger aircraft or a special sort of airplane. All kinds of airplanes, of course, have some common characteristics. They have to be able to fly, have a source of power to do that and so forth. But ever since the Wright brothers first powered flight in 1903, we've seen the evolution of aircraft types as different as stealth fighters and Boeing 777s. And similarly, all ships have to float, stay upright and move, but research ships now have some very big differences from uh, cruise ships or destroyers or cargo carriers or what have you. That century plus span of time since the Wright brothers is roughly the same as the era of 
purposeful shipborne exploration of the oceans for science. That is generally dated to the famous global voyage of HMS Challenger in 1872 to 76. This next slide <clears throat> shows the uh, voyage track and an image of the ship. Uh, Challenger was a, a Royal Navy Corvette, which was a type not particularly distinguished in military terms. She was launched in 1858, so by 1872, she likely was limited usefulness for the Royal Navy, and therefore, presumably, a handing over of it to the scientists wasn't particularly re resisted by the brass. Um, moderate alterations were made to remove uh, cannons and install sounding gear and winches and convert some interior spaces into laboratory uses and so on. Next slide, please. And some of these are suggested in this slide. You can see an image of an interior laboratory space with all sorts of fairly basic apparatus here and there. And on the exterior, you can see a number of, of uh, pieces of, of over the side apparatus uh, hanging on ropes that are slung from the yard arms. This whole approach of adapting and modifying available naval or other vessels to do ocean science carried on into the 20th century, as we'll see. But nowadays, most research vessels are specifically designed from scratch for ocean research, since the equipment and the vessel specifications needed now are much more complicated and demanding than was the case for modifying the existing ship Challenger. Challenger set out to paint on a nearly blank canvas the unseen world of the open sea. The Royal Society wisely set broad exploratory objectives suited to such a reconnaissance effort as shown in this slide. Next slide. You can read them for yourself to investigate, number one, investigate physical conditions in the deep sea. Number two, to look at the chemical composition of seawater. Number three, ascertain physical and chemical characteristics of deep sea deposits. And number four, to look at the distribution of organic life. And there's a summary of the observations that <clears throat> Challenger accomplished in the course of that voyage. In short, the idea was to start out with the basics. <clears throat> Many of these fundamentals still drive research today. We still need to know the detailed shape and nature of the seabed and the earth underneath it better than we do, much more than Challenger's 500 total depth soundings, as in items one and three. Long after the Challenger expedition, Roger Revelle once remarked, quote, we know less about the ocean's bottom than about the moon's backside, unquote. And important questions about that bottom still remain. <clears throat> We still need more and better measurements and particularly ongoing repeated measurements to understand the distributions of temperatures, circulations and currents and their variations in time. And as an item two, we still need knowledge of seawater chemistry and its changes, particularly as this relates now to the capacity of the oceans to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And regarding item number four, Challenger, as you can read, discovered some 4,700 new marine species but a lot more new ones have been discovered since then and they continue to be discovered today. So these challenger objectives, broadly speaking, remain relevant for ocean science in 2022. The ability of modern ships and scientific equipment to make some of these kinds of measurements and specimen collections is of course light years ahead of challenger, a result of advances in science and technology and in ship design. Those uh, 500 depth soundings for, on challenger, for example, would be the work of only minutes underway with a modern ship's multi-beam acoustic echo sounder. There'd be no need as on Challenger to stop the ship, lower a line with a lead weight at the end of it until it hit the bottom and then haul it back to figure out how deep the ocean was. The number of chemical and biochemical analyses of seawater samples that are now standard were simply unknown back then. <clears throat> so let's now shift gears a little bit and look quickly at the beginnings of Scripps and the Scripps fleet. You're gonna see some philosophical and intellectual connections to the scientific quest exemplified by the Challenger voyage. That is to study an unknown ocean world and particularly in our case, the Pacific portion of it, starting with the California nearshore region. I'll have to skim over a lot of this interesting history, but I'm gonna put some relevant references in the chat. Um, next slide is a picture of uh, four important people. Um, William Ritter, the first director of Scripps, came to California in 1885. He spent a year teaching in Fresno before he entered the University of California, that is to say Berkeley back then, graduating in 1888. He spent a further year at Berkeley and then two years at Harvard getting his PhD in zoology for a thesis on the blind goby, a fish that's found along the Point Loma shore. He returned to Berkeley in 1891 to chair the new zoology department there and to marry Mary Bennett, <coughs> who was a, a medical doctor in 1886, whom he'd met during his Fresno teaching year. 
They honeymooned in San Diego, where presumably through that medical doctor connection, they met the MD couple, Fred and Charlotte Baker. Well, Fred Baker was active in many civic circles and he was an enthusiastic amateur marine naturalist in addition to his professional medical work. He became a persistent proponent, proponent excuse me, of San Diego as the best location to fit Ritter's ongoing search for a permanent location for his summertime investigations, which were essentially nearshore marine biology field camps during the academic summer vacations. Some of this was based at the Hotel Del Coronado in its boathouse in the next slide. There's, there's all of Scripps in 1904 and working out of the boathouse. Ritter and his colleagues spent a number of subsequent summers trying out various coastal locations, notably in San Pedro. He kept thinking of a more permanent base for systematic sustained marine investigations instead of uh, short-term summer vacation camps. His perspective was the untapped <clears throat> promise of the Pacific for basic marine biological surveys, what we would now call biogeography, that is the observing and understanding of which organisms lived where and how. As he wrote later in the next slide, imperfectly as had any of the fields of zoology in Western America been cultivated, the least studied of all had been the teeming life of the great ocean on whose <clears throat> margin the university is located. There were other nearshore marine biological stations already at Naples and Italy and Woods Hole and elsewhere. The California coast was going to be Ritter's province and Pacific Gateway. Remember that Ritter's quote, least studied unquote, Pacific is indeed a great ocean. We tend to think of Mercator maps like this one, next slide, with the Pacific split and the continents drawn too large. But in the next slide is a truer view of the Pacific hemisphere as seen from out in space. Next slide, there we go. Uh, in, you know, this is what you would see if you were actually out there looking at the right spot. You can see little Hawaii near the center, but you really have to squint to see those wisps of continental land on the outer edges of this view. There were pros and cons of different sites for Ritter. San Francisco Bay was of course handy to the university, but it was nearly landlocked and under the freshwater influence of the Delta Rivers. Pacific Grove already had the Hopkins Laboratory of Stanford. In San Pedro, harbor improvements and dredging were gonna disturb or even demolish some of the best collecting grounds there. So Baker kept up his advocacy in his quest for funds. The San Diego Chamber of Commerce, prided by Baker, established a Marine Laboratory Committee to seek private funds. Among other successes, they scored a promise of $500 from a quote, wealthy rancher, unquote, who hoped that Ritter could meet him when he next came to San Diego. That rancher was the newspaper baron E.W. Scripps, whose support of that and that of his older half sister Ellen B. Scripps would be crucial to the establishment, survival, and growth of the institution and to its early forays out to sea on ships. Uh, here's a picture of brother and sister. Ellen, I should say, was a truly remarkable woman, a giant in the history of this region for the use of her considerable fortune, all of which was earned, not inherited, for many civic and progressive causes, more than just Scripps Oceanography. We have Scripps Hospital, Scripps College, the Bishop School, Torrey Pines Reserve, San Diego Zoo, all of these and more. I really suggest you read Molly McLean's outstanding biography of Ellen. I'm gonna put a reference in the chat. The, this Ritter Scripps meeting took place in the summer of 1903, after which Ritter reported to the Chamber of Commerce Committee, quote, I'm not gonna report now that San Diego is unquestionably the best place on earth for such an institution. I am simply going to say that it is undoubtedly an excellent place from several points of view, one of the best, and furthermore, there can be no doubt that a laboratory capable of great things for biological science might be built in San Diego. And so in September of 1903, the San Diego Marine Biological Association was formed and in the words of its bylaws, quote, the general purposes of the institution shall be to carry on a biological and hydrographic survey of the waters of the Pacific Ocean adjacent to the coast of Southern California and to prosecute such other kindred undertakings as the board of trustees may from time to time deem it wise to enter upon that uh, such other kindred undertakings is a nicely open-ended phrase with plenty of expansion room for future types and regions of investigations. The work of putting the Biological Association on a sound footing, financial and otherwise, occupied a lot of Ritter's effort in these early years and no factor was more important than support from E.W. and Ellen B. Scripps. Between 1903 and 15, a total of about $400,000, which would be about 10 million in today's dollars, came from the brother and sister, most of it from Ellen. There was an endowment fund, funds for particular projects like the very first Scripps Pier on the beach and more. The quest for a permanent location away from only summertime use of places like the 
Hotel Dell first resulted in the Little Green Laboratory built at Alligator Head on city land above La Jolla Cove. There's a picture of it. Um, and on the inside of this, in the next slide, we see the lab was pretty basic with ordinary uh, sampling and, and analysis materials, uh, not unlike that space on board Challenger that I showed you early. Later on, the association sought a site that would belong outright to it, not be on, leased on city property with fewer public access requirements than there were at the Cove, with greater separation from the sewage impacts there, unfortunately, and with more room for future expansion. EW also wanted to thwart the efforts of the local land company that was trying to move the station to some land in Del Mar and therefore away from Ellen's La Jolla home. So EW helped to organize a one-bid auction in 1907 of a 170-acre tract of City of San Diego Pueblo lands, the lands where Scripps sits today. He wrote an extensive and one must say mostly speculative prospectus for all the scientific developments and facilities that would arise on this land. The sole bid for $1,000 then came from, you guessed it, the Marine Biological Association. The land might have been worth about thirty dollars to $50,000 at that time, but offsetting this was the fact that the city would once again have its full use of the Alligator Head property, and Ellen pledged $10,000 for a road <coughs> from, uh, from the new property past the, from the, the 170 acre new property and on up to Torrey Pines near Del Mar. So here then was the kernel of permanent real estate from which Scripps would grow, uh, be formally joined to the university in 1912 and then form the cornerstone, obviously for the much later creation of UCSD, which used much more city land. You should read more of this fascinating history in, the, in both of the, the books by Moulton and Raitt and by Shore that I'm gonna put in the chat and likewise in Jack Fisher's excellent essay on UCSD land acquisitions for which I'm putting a link in the chat. So on this 170 acre site, the first really permanent Scripps structure, the George H. Scripps building named for a brother of Ellen E. W. arose in 1910. There's a picture of it, you know, back in the good old days and the picture of it today. Um, <clears throat> it was built with some room to grow and indeed for a time, the Ritters lived on the top floor of it, which was not needed immediately for laboratory space. The building is still in use, not for research purposes, of course. It's indeed the oldest oceanographic research building still in continuous use in the U.S., and it was declared a National Historic Landmark in 1982. In terms of ships, or more commonly boats, for collections of marine specimens near shore, the early years had depended on a sort of boats for Ritters' summertime specimen collections. But with the Scripps support and the settling of the uh, Marine Biological Association in La Jolla and the shift to a full-time, not just a summer scientific program and a, a building, the, the need for better ship resources grew. At first, EW offered the use of his yacht, Loma. Next slide, there it is. Uh, with the uh, agreement that it would be modified as needed for, for the scientific work under the condition to be put back into yacht condition and returned to him eventually. So we're talking about making changes to a yacht, not building a ship from scratch. The service of this vessel in the summer of 1904 was intended, but work on shipyard modifications delayed that until 1905. And then in 1906, the vessel ran aground and was wrecked near Point Loma, as shown in the next slide. Fortunately, EW by then had deeded the vessel outright to the association and his remark upon hearing about, upon hearing about the wreck was, quote, at least it will kill all those damned fleas. <laughs> Ellen then stepped up and funded the building of Alexander Agassiz, the then ship that was in that first slide. It was the first U.S. vessel designed and built specifically for supporting ocean science. Here's a picture of the ship at launching. Next slide. That's right. And here's another picture of the same ship underway. Next slide. There we go. <clears throat> like Challenger and Loma, Agassiz was fundamentally a conventional sailing ship with rather modest basic scientific spaces and equipment added but really no major aspects of design and form driven by scientific requirements. Scientific tools and measurement needs remain similar to those of the Challenger voyage, very low tech hardware for determination of depths, collection of bottom sediment samples and biological samples and so forth. Agassiz served from 1907 to 17, but then was sold as too costly to maintain and operate on the slender budget of the institution. Work at sea as distinct from daytime near shore collections with small boats then entered a kind of lean era. Scripps was able to purchase the Perth St. Arthadius in 1925 and it refitted the vessel 
and fitted the vessel, renamed scripts for some modest regional work, regular temperature and salinity measurements and sampling of bottom sediments. Maybe the most significant impact of that ship <coughs> was to sink the hook of scientific seagoing into the new graduate student named Roger Revelle. Next slide, please. There's Roger hanging over the side. On his first sea trip as the new boy, Roger was obliged by tradition to cook the lunch. That's a tradition which fortunately has lapsed. He later wrote of his first day at sea, quote, it was one of the finest days I've ever spent. I believe I decided then and there that I would spend the rest of my life as an oceanographer. Being at the same time a sailor and a scientist seemed too good to be true, unquote. Not long after this, the, the vessel suffered an onboard explosion and a fire at the pier that critically injured two crew members, one of whom later died of his injuries. And so Scripps was once again without seagoing capability. Into this gap stepped Robert Bob Scripps, who was the son and primary heir of EW. Bob Scripps purchased the yacht Serena of the actor Lewis Stone, and this ship, renamed EW Scripps, began to take the institution to the open ocean in a significant way. The new director, Harold Sverdrup, who started in 1936, was championing this broadening of the effort. The first really long distance expedition to the Gulf of California took place in 1939. In the next slide, you can see the vessel and you can see the, <clears throat> the group on board with Roger as usual, the tallest person in the, in the figure. Well, all too soon after this, the, um, the outbreak of war in Europe and then in the Pacific upended civilian ocean science at Scripps and nationwide, in fact. The war transformed what the science was about, the resources and the sponsors for it, the methods used. Acoustic systems in particular rapidly came of age for submarine warfare applications and for mapping the depths, no more lead lines to be heaved over the side. Existing civilian oceanographic ships like EW Scripps and a few similar vessels elsewhere were quickly pressed into such wartime investigations as they could support despite their now dated equipment and capabilities. EW Scripps was returned post-war to the institution by the Navy and it continued in service for a time, but in parallel, a number of military surplus vessels were now available for oceanographic institutions to take over <clears throat> and put to work, responding to this sudden surge of Navy interest in ocean problems, Navy resources to study them. Even such remodeled military hand-me-downs generally had better capabilities for scientific work at sea than the older ships like EW Scripps. Here are three such vessels that were obtained by Scripps. Um, you can see them pictured there and, and something about where they came from. These secondhand ships inaugurated a golden age of far-flung Scripps expeditions. Sverdrup had returned to his native Norway in 1948, so the era of ocean-spanning expeditions and Scripps really blossomed under Sverdrup's protege and new director, Roger Revelle. He took full advantage of the post-war surge of Navy problems, Navy needs for ocean science, Navy resources and surplus vessels to fertilize that blooming, Ravel's own stature as a wartime Navy officer and his substantial Navy connections, his strong Sverdrup inspired inclination toward multidisciplinary exploratory seagoing research all added to the blossoming. This next slide maps some of these early voyages. <clears throat> Notice how number one, Midpack, gets to the Marshall Islands where Bikini, the atomic bomb test site, sits. Part of this expedition involves seismic studies of the seafloor and other investigations in that region as follow-up to the 1946 atom bomb test in Operation Crossroads. Those tests had used some surplus combat vessels to test the blast and other effect on those ships, a matter of obvious Navy relevance. Uh, number four in that picture, Capricorn, involves Scripps participation in the thermonuclear test named Ivy with scientific studies again related to the explosion and its effects. In some expeditions like these were organized and funded in part to address current military issues, but they were also designed to carry out new and improved basic investigations of the broad Pacific, physical, chemical, and geological. Somewhat later, even more capable Navy surplus vessels came into scientific service. Here is Argo, a really substantial ocean going ship, 213 feet. Two such ex Navy ocean going tugs and salvage vessels came to the oceanographic institutions around the same time, both having been built at Napa, California in 1943-44. The sister ship Chain came to Woods Hole and I have sailed on her into the edge, edge of a hurricane. She was a solid seaworthy ship. I've not sailed on Argo myself. These ships underwent some adaptations to incorporate significant pieces of oceanographic capability. Look at that stern A-frame 
and crane on Argo, which are needed for handling large oceanographic packages into and out of the water. Those were added after the handover of the ship from the Navy. They represent progress from that picture of Roger Revelle precariously leaning over the side, attaching a small sampling bottle to a wire. Or from that picture of Challenger with its assorted scientific nets and ropes slung as well as could be managed from the existing yard arms of a sailing ship. In the 1960s, the Navy launched its TENOC, 10 Years of Oceanography program, to beef up its own in-house programs and fund new support ships and do the same for selected civilian programs and institutions. Here's the title page of the TENOC report. If you squint, you can see that there's a copy in the UCSD library. And on the next page, one small extract shows the in-club of institutions relevant to the Navy effort, scripts among them. <clears throat> and you recall that the Sputnik had happened in 1957, just a short time previously, shocking the United States and galvanizing a national effort to catch up to the USSR in science and technology generally and in military or Navy relevant science and technology particularly, and hence the Navy urgency and funds for programs like TENOC. As one result of TENOC, some new ships for civilian oceanography were funded and built by the Navy, Conrad at Le Mans in New York, the first Thomas Thompson at the University of Washington and the Thomas Washington at Scripps delivered in 1965. There she is, still has her Navy designator painted on the bow. <clears throat> um, these were the first new builds for US oceanographic ships since the war. These ships were meant for general open ocean work across all the scientific disciplines using the tools of the trade as they then existed, acoustic echo sounders instead of lead lines, better winches, wires, and systems for deploying and towing various samplers and packages over the side, a bow thruster to enable precise ship maneuvering when handling or, or towing those instruments or maneuvering them near the bottom. Later on, Washington became one of the first academic ships to carry a multi-beam or swath bottom mapping system. We'll talk a bit more about that method later on. Washington was also the first research vessel to carry a computer used to analyze data in real time. An IBM 800, 1800 machine using punch cards for input, line printer for printed output, taking up a whole room on the ship. You probably have more compute power and certainly have snazzier visual outputs in your smartphone. <clears throat> Washington, like the other Navy funded research ships of post war times, was operated by an academic institution, Scripps in this case, but the ownership remained with the Navy. And when the time came to retire the ship from US service due to age and obsolescence, Federal rules required it to be offered to friendly nations and allies. So Washington was handed over in 1992 to the Chilean Navy as a military survey ship, making ongoing use of its bottom mapping and other capabilities. Renamed Vidal Gormaz, she continued in Chilean silver service until final disposition and scrapping in 2012. There's a picture of her painted gray in Chilean service and then later on in 2012 at the, at the uh, Shipbreakers Yard in Puerto Montt in Chile. <coughs> the next step forward in Navy provided ships for academic institutions came near the turn of the 60s. Here's the research vessel Melville of Scripps. No, that's not Herman Melville of Moby Dick, but Rear Admiral George Melville, a remarkable Navy engineering officer and Arctic explorer with a fascinating biography and a near death voyage in the Russian Arctic. There's not enough time here to delve into that aspect, but his book is in the UC Remote Library Connections, and I'll put a reference to it in the chat. As designed and built, Melville and her sister ship Nor at Woods Hole had the ultimate in ship maneuverability in aid of deploying and maneuvering instrument packages close to the sea floor. The ships were powered with cycloidal propellers, which are a kind of gold standard in maneuverability and are much used in ferries, harbor tugs, oil rig tenders, and other sorts of ships that have to do a lot of very precise positioning and moving. Cycloidal propellers are something like helicopter rotors turned sideways, next slide. Uh, those wing-like blades, like helicopter rotor blades, can change their angle of attack during each revolution of the circular plate that holds them. So their lift or thrust can be controlled to point in any desired horizontal direction. Such ships can and do move sideways or even turn about in their own length as illustrated here by some other ship. <clears throat> using cycloids at the bow and the stern. So this is great stuff for maneuverability so far, but <clears throat> cycloids hadn't previously been used in open ocean service. So their durability and reliability on a ship being tossed about in an open seaway was unclear. And furthermore, the German firm that made the cycloid units advised the US Navy to power them with electric motors above each unit. 
the Navy said, thank you for your advice. We know better and we will power them economically with a single engine in midships and long drive shafts with bearings and gears running forward and aft to the two cycloids, one at the bow and one at the stern. Bad idea. These ships had chronic problems and breakdowns due to mechanical vibrations and bearing issues in that drivetrain. There was also far too much acoustic noise in the water impacting the performance of sonars. The forward cycloid on the ships in particular was like a giant egg beater up near the bow, injecting a lot of noise and bubbles that impacted many of the hull mounted sonar transducers nearby. You could idle the forward cycloid, reducing that noise impact somewhat, but then the ship was slow, getting in the way of doing efficient bottom mapping. So it eventually became clear that a major midlife refit of both, refit of both ships to address these issues was needed. The solution was to scrap the existing power scheme and put in twin steerable propellers by the stern, plus a transverse thruster by the bow. <clears throat> Perhaps not quite the gold standard for maneuvering, but certainly a very capable sterling silver standard and bound to be more reliable mechanically and far quieter acoustically. But the engines and generators needed to drive all those units would necessarily take up more space and weight than the, the original single engine. That would impact space for science and also make the ship heavier and hence slower. But the ships were already heavier and steaming slower than had been planned. The National Science Foundation, which at that time was spinning up some large global ocean programs that would require use of both of these ships, made it clear that both ships needed to have more, not less space after the refit for scientific purposes and accommodations to handle those programs. At that time, John Leiby, the Marine architect of Woods Hole pointed out that if one cut the ship in half at the right place and added a new midsection, one could get additional space, which would also float the ships higher in the water. Well, the Navy had some sticker shock at going beyond just refitting the existing hull. But in the end, this cut in half and stretch approach won out. This slide shows Melville taken out of the water in 1991 at the shipyard in Louisiana prior to the rework. I think the top of that crane is perhaps the highest elevation in all of coastal Louisiana. You can see the blades of the fore and aft cycloids underneath the ship. The Libby cut was roughly along that red line that I've overlaid here, the region where the hull shape is parallel fore and aft. The new inserted section was 34 feet long and you can see the difference here after the refit. <sighs> The refit project was very successful, giving the ship another quarter century of effective use on projects that the original ship could not have handled on grounds of space, accommodations, acoustic properties, and more. The ship acquired a multi-beam sonar system in consequence of this work. That would have been a noise non-starter previously. And finally, in 2016, following the path of Thomas Washington, uh, Melville, then the oldest active ship in the US academic fleet, was given to the Philippine Navy where it operates today as their oceanographic ship, Gregorio Velasquez, is still making effective use of the multi-beam system. Next slide, there, there it is. Um, so now we come to the ships of the Scripps fleet as they are today. I'll step through them rather quickly. You can see some uh, basic information in each case about size, length, numbers of crew and scientists, date of construction and so forth. You'll also see that the two larger ships continue the pattern of Navy ownership with institutional operation. The smaller ships are owned by the university. You'll also see some common features that distinguish today's purpose-built research ships, large and small, from some of the adapted sailing vessels or immediate post-war hand-me-downs of earlier times. Interior arrangements not shown in these slides now answer to requirements for scientific spaces and civilian accommodations, not military ones. But you'll see open deck spaces to work on instruments or samples, cranes and A-frames for getting uh, complex heavy instrument packages into and out of the water safely, winches to do the lowering and raising and so forth. Again, we don't have to have Roger Revelle hanging over the rail attaching sampling bottles to a, to a mechanical cable anymore. Uh, next slide, yes. <clears throat> the research vessel Bob and Betty Beister is our newest and smallest vessel, just designed for day trips uh, with one pilot and a few scientists aboard testing new instruments, doing limited sampling operations. The boat was built with donated funds from the Beister family members, friends of theirs, SAIC associates of Robert Beister, who was the founder of SAIC. You can even see on this small vessel, the useful amount of open deck space, an A-frame for deploying and retrieving instrument packages and a small crane or David for handling objects over the side. Next slide. Sally Ride is the newest of our large ships, incorporating the best of modern capabilities for ship operation and science on the global ocean. 
She's Navy owned, Scripps operated, continuing that pattern of partnership that has been central to civilian ocean science in the US system. The ship was built with several modern features. Some of them have also been added or upgraded on the research vessel Roger Revelle during a recent major midlife refit about which we'll now talk. Here's Roger Revelle, the largest ship of the fleet in terms of size, scientific accommodations, deck and laboratory spaces, et cetera. She underwent a considerable midlife refit at around the 20 year mark to extend useful life and to incorporate some significant upgrades and modernizations upgrades that have become necessary or at least highly desirable in light of experience since construction, lessons learned, technical advances, regulatory changes since, uh, since construction. Uh, now I'm gonna play a short video about the refit work, which is truly major surgery with a much improved patient outcome, although not perhaps quite as dramatic as cutting Melville in half and stretching that ship. Can we run that uh, video clip? Research vessel Roger Revelle, which entered service in 1996, is owned by the U.S. Navy and operated by Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Roger Revelle was a naval officer and groundbreaking scientist who was one of the first to raise the alarm about how rising carbon dioxide levels could impact Earth's climate. His strong leadership propelled Scripps Oceanography to an international stage while he served as its director, and he was a key figure in the creation of UC San Diego. The vessel that bears his name established itself as vitally important to U.S. oceanographic research due to its range, payload, duration, and ability to safely conduct scientific operations in remote areas around the globe. One of the largest ships in the U.S. academic research fleet, Roger Revelle has a track record of supporting ambitious scientific missions that span the world's oceans. It has carried more than 24,000 scientists and students on scientific missions worldwide. The refit began in 2019 with support from the Office of Naval Research, National Science Foundation, and Scripps Oceanography. The refit made upgrades to mechanical systems, scientific instrumentation, living and working areas, and in reducing the vessel's environmental impact. Improvements include a new power plant, including clean running diesel engines that reduce emissions by up to two thirds, an extendable bow thruster to improve maneuverability and handling for precise scientific operations, a new ballast water treatment system that protects against the spread of invasive species. A new acoustics gondola that houses a suite of upgraded and new instruments for mapping the seafloor, identifying organisms, measuring currents, and more. Advanced shipboard networking and new satellite communication systems that improve connection with shore and a new infrastructure for computing. New cranes and the refurbishment of the A-frame and hydrographic boom used to deploy and recover instruments. These improvements will extend the life of the vessel by 15 to 20 years, bolster scientific and seagoing capabilities, and allow Roger Revelle to support Navy and national oceanographic research objectives. Academic research vessels play a critical role in the exploration of our planet. Ship-based research is vital for observation and measurement and offers the transformative potential to understand global change and monitor the health of ocean ecosystems. With the completion of the midlife refit, Roger Revelle will continue to enable global research and train future generations of seagoing researchers and technicians as they work to further understand and protect our planet. Here we go. <clears throat> um, and now we go to finally to the research vessel Sprawl which is our workhorse for regional voyages, a kind of a no frills vessel originally used in the oil rig workboat business to which Scripps added lab spaces and some other features. It's also the oldest of the current fleet, as you can see, raising considerations about a future vessel in the mid-sized capability gap between the Beister at the small end and Sally Ryder Roger Revelle at the big end. More on that in a moment. This uh, illustration uh, based on Sally Ride shows in a general way some of the modern features and capabilities that are on the larger ships like Sally Ride and Roger Revell, things that differentiate effective research ships from other sorts of ships. You can see the emphasis on handling equipment, A-frames, winches, and cranes to get instrument packages deployed and recovered successfully. In that video clip on the Revell, you saw some glimpses of a CTD package like the one illustrated here with its array of seawater sampling bottles around a circular housing. Well, that object might weigh a ton or so, so handling it safely into and out of the water on a rolling deck requires proper cranes and equipment, not just a bunch of graduate students heaving on tag lines that are attached to this ton-sized object swinging on a wire overhead. These things can't simply be duct taped onto ships not designed for them in the first place. 
space, power, location of winch controls and other such necessities for, for handling such gear will have to be designed in. Same can be said for ship maneuvering and positioning capabilities when they're controlling and maneuvering such instrumenta instrumentation packages in the water or near the bottom or even on it. <clears throat> uh, acoustic system, systems are critical for a whole lot of things these days. And so their spaces and locations are, and of their transducers are fundamental design considerations. The multi-beam system, as this sketch suggests, sounds the depth of the seabed in a broad swath as the ship moves ahead, not just in a small spot directly below the ship. And so as such, it's a tremendous step forward in mapping and studying the seafloor, but it is very sensitive to ship noise and especially to air bubbles below the hull, matters that have to be dealt with in the initial design of the ship with attention to the hydrodynamics of the hull and the placement of transducers. The Revell refit, as you saw, involved a new acoustics gondola to defeat bubbles on that ship. Uh, on Sally Ride, the designed hull form and the flow patterns allow for flush mounted transducers to perform satisfactorily in that hull without requiring a gondola to keep the transducers beneath the bubbles, uh, which is a beneficial result of some lessons learned <clears throat> over the years between the uh, designs of the two ships and experience with multi-beam uh, systems. Um, the illustration also indicates some ways in which ships are becoming central bases or command sites for managing other vehicles that are involved in the investigation but aren't actually connected to the ship, underwater vehicles and airborne ones. This picture, for example, uh, shows a drone being launched from Melville in 2007 to carry a magnetometer and extend the range of seafloor magnetic mapping beyond the ship. The drone produced some 6,200 miles of magnetic measurements during about 100 total flight hours, which would be about six times what the ship alone could have done in the same period of time. So this combination of shipboard human intelligence and unmanned vehicle endurance and range is an example of a powerful extension of observational capability for magnetics and in fact, for other kinds of data. Um, the quiz question for later is to tell me how you get this drone back aboard. <clears throat> uh, to wind up, let me make some quick notes about one Scripps vessel headed out of service and another may appear someday soon. The vessel leaving service is the unique Scripps platform flip, floating instrument platform, there you are. It's not really a ship, it has no propulsion, it has to be towed to the work area, but once there, as the inset pictures at the bottom show, ballast tanks in the long part of the structure are flooded like a submarine submerging and the vessel rotates 90 degrees to upright as in the main picture. Um, <clears throat> when it's upright, it's a very stable spar buoy in the open ocean, surface waves come and go, but the business end with the scientists, the accommodations, the labs, and the various booms to deploy instruments move hardly at all in the vertical. So those suspended instruments don't get sloshed up and down in the deeper water. That was the primary reason for FLIP in the first place, to deploy deep hydrophones quietly, decoupled from noisy sloshing if they'd been suspended from a bouncing surface ship. FLIP has had a remarkable run of service to many investigators in underwater acoustics and other subjects since 1962 but it now needs serious structural rework to make, be made seaworthy again. <clears throat> and the overall scientific demand for its singular capabilities has diminished. <clears throat> Newer technologies have replaced some of what only FLIP could do formerly. The owner, again, the Navy, isn't going to invest in the necessary structural rework for, few, for further operations at sea. So the vessel will retire. Uh, the Marine Army's Museum may be interested or it may be scrapped. All of that's being investigated now. This future ship, this is an artist's rendition, is planned to be a hybrid with conventional diesel power, but also with zero emission power from liquid hydrogen and a fuel cell. This project is underway with a $35 million piece of funding from the state of California. The zero emission hydrogen power system should suffice for about 75% of the sprawl sorts of operations that are envisioned. So the ship will be very green, if not 100% zero emission. And as such, it's gonna put research vessels and scripts in the forefront of efforts to decarbonize research ships in the future. So we've come a long way in a century or so. Um, Scripps ships have voyaged over a lot more of the global ocean since the days of the post-war expeditions. There's a comparison between ship tracks more or less to date and the ship tracks of the early expeditions. Um, and big international programs, such as the one on this next slide called CLIVAR, Climate and Ocean Variability 
and the repeat hydrography portion of that are taking today's methods to see on multiple ships and gathering vastly more observations and more types of measurements on these long tracks indicated in the map than Challenger ever could. <clears throat> and please note the word repeat in the name to measure change in the ocean a single survey, a la the Challenger voyage, remarkable though it was, obviously isn't enough. Uh, in fact, there's good use being made of the Challenger data versus uh, modern data to uh, learn something about changes in the deep ocean. They're very subtle, but they're there. The Challenger repeat program seeks to reoccupy these lines maybe once per decade to measure long-term changes. It's still a big ocean out there with a lot of measurements and a lot of repeated measurements still very much needed and many mysteries that still need to be solved. And so that exploratory quest begun by Challenger still goes on. Next slide. With that, I think I will wrap up with sincere thanks to my successor as Associate Director, Bruce Applegate for a lot of fact checking in a number of these slides. And with that, I think I'll take questions. Bob, what a fabulous overview. I learned so much, really, really interesting.